Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship, the last Sunday of August. Uh, it's a joy to welcome all of you today. And as you can see in the background, I have a new item. This is something that has a long history with our church. And I thought I might share that with you as we begin. Today, we're going to be looking at a scripture that speaks to us of picking up our own cross and bearing our cross. And this is called the tooled copper cross. And uh, I have a, um, a little history that I found as I was going through some of the Christian ed things. This is written by Ralph Beach. Ralph Beach died two months before I came to the Federated Church in 1996. And um, that's coming up on, it's 24 years ago now that that took place. But I wanted to share what he wrote about this cross behind me this morning. Uh, he says, I'd like to tell you the story of the cross. It begins back in the later 50s. The Sunday school classes were crowded into the very limited basement area of the old congregational church, which stood where the bell tower now stands. One class was crowded into the dusty furnace room. Since it was so crowded, there was no place for the early arrivals to gather, and they did not know what to do while the teachers were rushing to set up for the lessons. Margaret Beach was the teacher for the junior department. She was seeking something for the early birds to do until it was time for Sunday school. She had expressed her wish for a needed worship center for the class. She got an idea when she saw Ralph teaching some young Cub Scouts to do copper tooling. She drafted Ralph to help. First, we created a cross according to the balanced specifications. We obtained a book of church symbols Patterns were copied from which the youth could choose what pattern they wanted to make. Some chose a couple of patterns. They finished, the finished patterns were fashioned into small plaques, which were fastened to the face of the cross to create the first and main part of our worship center. Um, and Ralph goes on to say, I hope that I might recall the names of all who helped to make the cross. I do recall the following, Doug Hunt, Paula Schneider, Sandy Schultz, Ricky Robinson, Ronald Munsey, Mary Burling, Darlene Fundell, Thea Sommerfeld, Francis Munsey, Andy Zeratsky, Merle Walner, Janice Ewall, David Anderson, and Avalie Grams. Our daughter Mary also helped, though she was in another class. The assistant teacher was Mrs. Ida Morrison. Even she tried her hand at it. All this class met in the small room at the bottom of the basement stairs. And there's a little bit more to the history of this cross this morning. I won't share it all, but it's uh, a wonderful piece of history. And uh, I know that I recognize a couple of those names, and um, they are a little bit farther in years away from being juniors. But we're grateful that we have this cross with us this morning. I want to share just a couple other announcements. We've begun a new book group, and it is based on a book called Moral Leadership by Robert Franklin. And if anyone's interested in joining that group, all you need to do is let me know, and I will invite you to our Zoom meeting. Uh, we just started, so we would love and welcome newcomers. Also, um, there's uh, multiple ways to continue to financially support our church. I've, I say this consistently on Sundays, but just so that you know, um, you can send in your financial tithes and offerings. We are grateful for those. You can uh, use electronic funds transfer, or you can use PayPal if you go to our Federated Church website and uh, click on the online donation, the PayPal button there. Our September Anchor is going to be mailed out this week. It's going to be mailed out first class, so you should have it by the end of this week. And today we're going to start something new. Um, we're inviting people to record yourself as our liturgist. So I'm really grateful that we have a guest liturgist for this morning and I'm going to wait until the scripture time to tell you who that guest is. But if you would be willing to record yourself reading a Sunday scripture, that would give us the opportunity to see you and feel the, the bonds of our community of faith. So as we gather uh, for worship this morning, I always like to begin 
with anything we are grateful for. And so I invite you to uh, list in the chat area this morning anything you might be grateful for. Last week I was asked to pray for rain. Well, I think that prayer was answered and I'm not claiming any strong persuasive skills in my prayers. But I think a lot of people were praying for rain, so we're grateful for the rain. And we do pray for any who are dealing with the abundance of rain to the point where it's done any kind of damage. <clears throat> we want to pray for, or we want to give God thanks for the work that David Marwitz did for us in our choir room. We needed to expand the area of our closets, and David took two days of his uh, working life and donated those to us and we're so grateful for his work. <clears throat> and also I would like to thank you for the ways in which you connected with people this past week. That was our charge from last week's sermon was to connect with people so that we continue to be the church and remain connected to one another. So I am grateful for that and I thank you for that and I pray that we continue to keep doing that. So as we do this this morning, would you join with me in a time of a prayer of gratitude? Lord, you are an abundant giver. There is nothing that I have that you have not given me. The way of your kingdom is the way of generosity. Help us to honor you with our resources. Free us from the deceit of riches. Lead us on the path of generosity. For your glory, Lord, for the abundance of our own lives, and for the sake of others. Amen. And as we turn to a time of praying for one another this morning, there are a number of prayer requests that I would like to share with you. This week, our students are returning to school, and we want to pray for all of our students in whatever form you're going to school, whether it's actually going to the building <coughs> or having some kind of modified schedule, or whether you're doing school virtually. We want to pray for you and bless you as you begin this new school year. And we want to pray for our teachers and our administrators and our parents. And I invite you to put in the chat area the name of any students or any teachers or any administrators that you would like to hold in prayer today. We want to pray for all of you as this school year begins. We want to pray for the family of Kenny Tednis who died unexpectedly this past week. Uh, we want to pray for those who are dealing with loved ones on hospice care, especially um, Deb Trost and her family. We want to pray for the Davis family, who are friends of John and Carolyn DeLong's. The wife, Colleen, died during a lung transplant surgery and operation, and she was just a young woman, and we want to pray for them and their children. We want to pray for those who are recovering from surgery. Both Kathy and Dale Gran are recovering from surgery and others. Those who have active COVID-19 right now and those recovering, especially this morning, we want to continue to pray for Dwayne Bark, uh, the superintendent of Marcus Ann Schools and any others. We want to pray for those who are undergoing cancer treatments and therapies. We remember Eric Miller uh, in this category and anyone else. I guess I have this on here twice, those with loved ones on hospice care, so we just double up those prayers for everyone. Uh, those with chronic health problems, Bonnie McDermott, uh, Sophie, others who have those kind of prayer needs. We want to pray for our country and our leadership. We do want to pray for the city of Kenosha and all places that are recovering from violence. We want to pray for the difficult work that needs to be done for healing in our communities and in our world. We want to pray for those who are recovering after the Hurricane Laura and all other natural disasters that have happened recently. 
And please feel free to add your prayer requests this morning as we pray together. Would you join with me in a moment of prayer? Let us pray. Lord, we gather here this morning as your people. We gather virtually again and we begin by asking you to strengthen the bonds of our hearts with one another. Help us to know the presence of the Holy Spirit that reminds us that we are loved by you and we are loved as a community of faith. You have heard our prayer requests this morning as we have presented them to you. You have seen the requests in our chat this morning. We have requests that are very personal and near to us, and we have much bigger prayer requests, Lord, uh, for things that are so much bigger than we are, but never bigger than who you are. So Lord, we gather these prayers together this morning, and we join in the prayer that Jesus taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Tommy Schroeder, and I will be doing this reading from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom.
So I want to thank Tommy for being our liturgist this morning and want to wish Tommy a very happy birthday. Tommy turned 16 this past week, and so we hope you had a great 16th birthday. So as I said at the beginning, we were going to share this scripture about bearing a cross. One of the best arguments for Christianity is this. Jesus is the best person to follow. Jesus is the right presence to lead us. Following Jesus, we are formed as Christ bearers and cross carriers to a cross inflicted world. One of the guiding statements I have always tried to keep in mind as I've done pastoral leadership is something like this. Any good leader, any successful leader, any true leader knows the right person to follow. The first step of leading a Christian life is the step of following Christ. In these moments, I invite us to ponder what it means for you, what it means for me, to follow Christ. In our scriptures, we read about Peter, who of course was a disciple and a follower of Jesus. He was following Jesus because he believed Jesus was the Messiah and the one to save everyone. We learned about this last week and Jesus was so pleased with him, he called him the rock upon which Jesus would build his church. That part Peter got right. But today, as Jesus was telling Peter and the disciples that complete messiahship was going to mean encountering the worst of humanity's hatred, condemnation, and the ability to destroy, and that Jesus was going to die, Peter halts here. Peter didn't like the trajectory of what Jesus was saying. I imagine Peter didn't want to lose his leader. He believed in Jesus, he loved Jesus, and he wasn't at all ready for Jesus to be gone from his life. So Peter the rock upon which the church would be built stepped out of line when he began to rebuke Jesus and then he became a stumbling stone. Peter was probably using some kind of homemade religious thinking and what I mean by that is that um, he was using some small amount of faith combined with his own personal preferences when he said, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. Peter's faith framework didn't know how to include the fact that the Messiah would suffer and die. So Jesus rebukes Peter strongly. Jesus knows that faced with death, we all struggle mightily. We're all fearful of death. Death is our common enemy. And that which is evil, or what Jesus calls Satan in our scripture this morning, uses our fears to foil our following. Jesus, in his strong rebuke of Satan, illuminates something to Peter. And with his strength of confrontation, Peter is shaken free from this untruth that he was spewing. And in that, he had to die to an understanding of what he thought the Messiahship should be and accept and be formed by what the Messiahship truly is. He was reformed and put back in line. In our following, we'll find that at times we are as solid as rock or we could be as hazardous as stumbling stones and something in us needs to die. Some cross needs to be born and somehow we need to be reformed. Now Jesus doesn't use fear to bring followers into line. In fact, following 
always remains voluntary. Jesus says in our scripture, if anyone wants to follow me, if someone wants to follow, Jesus will show them that bearing a cross means following him through deaths into life. A cross signifies death. Even though Jesus was in God and with God, Jesus began his journey to the cross when he humbled himself as God, became human, and encountered the most abusive form of human suffering, and experienced the most excruciating kind of human death. And because of this, Jesus is able to empathize with any kind of suffering and death. Jesus will come right into our suffering with us. He's not afraid of it. He loves us so deeply. He will never leave us alone. When we suffer as we follow, we will have Jesus' companionship. Following Jesus will include suffering that will ultimately leave, lead through our physical death into life, but it will also lead through many other deaths into a more fully formed life in Christ. Following anything else will only lead to suffering that will lead and end in death. Robert Mulholland, a New Testament theologian and an author, wrote a book called Invitation to a Journey, a road map for spiritual formation. And in this book, he writes about cruciform spirituality. And that means a cross-bearing, spiritual walking and following. Mahalan speaks about Jesus, about the Jesus following journey, which invites us to lose the false life that we have constructed out of defensive living so that we might find our true life, which is God's destiny for us. This is the journey of following and formation. This is the spiritual journey. The journey of being formed into the body of Christ is a series of deaths to our false selves. It is cruciform spirituality. For example, we die to pride so that we might be formed in humbleness. We die to control so that we might be formed in flexibility and receptivity. We die to expectations that were forged out of misguided passions so that we can be formed by the true desires that God has put into our hearts. We die to fears so that we can be formed in trust We're talking about cancel culture right now. And what what we're really saying is that something has died for us. Something has been canceled out. But we're finding that even in these deaths, as we follow Jesus, new life might be born. How many of us since March where we had a calendar probably full already from March through the summer, as things were being canceled, how many of us felt the ability to take a deep breath? And how many of us sensed a new uh, balance in our lives, a new ability to find Sabbath even in our lives? As I look at some of the expectations and some of the calendar items and some of the ways that calendars got so full and some of the things that have been canceled, I feel finally like I'm able to have the right amount on the plate of my schedule and not have too much or not have so much left undone. Maybe Christ was forming something new from these deaths in our schedules. Remember the rich young ruler who wanted to follow Jesus? 
Jesus told him all he had to do because he said, I keep all the commandments. I do all these things right. And Jesus says, you lack one thing. The one thing that you lack is that you need to sell all that you have and give it to the poor. The rich young ruler, the scripture says, went away sad because he had so much and because it was going to feel like so much death to him to let so much everything that he had, so much of what he had, go. The disciples were confused by this because Jesus then said, it's going to be easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than it will be for this rich young ruler to do this. And the disciples said, well, then who? Who will be able to do this? And Jesus says this phrase. He says, on our own, it's impossible. But with God, Nothing is impossible. So that when we step in line behind Jesus, when we follow Jesus, we are able to let go of those things that are not life-giving. We can go through those deaths we need to go through as we bear this cross so that we can become fully formed in Christ. Because, of course, the things of the rich young ruler weren't going to bring him life, but Jesus does. The cruciform life, the cross-bearing life, is following Jesus, being formed into the life of Jesus, and living that life in the tension of the cross. Now, when we look at this cross, we see a horizontal and we see a vertical. The image of the cross has both things. It reminds us that we live in the world, but we are not of the world. That we live in relationship with others and in relationship with God. That we commit to following Christ and walking with the world that Christ loves. And there is tension here as we do both at the same time. Some want to exit the realities of the world and spend only their time here. Some want to just talk about the world's sufferings but not bring them or dare to walk them out bearing the love of Christ. Mulholland writes, there is creative tension between our spiritual pilgrimage and the world in which we live out this pilgrimage. If we attempt to undo this difficult tension, we move into an unworldly spirituality that isolates us from the world. Or we move into a worldly spirituality which insulates us from the radical demands of a relationship with God. I'd like to say that one more time, that Mahalan talks about this creative tension that there is between the spiritual pilgrimage and the world that we live this pilgrimage in. That if we attempt to undo this difficult tension, we move into an unworldly spirituality that isolates us from the world, or we move just into a worldly spirituality that insulates us from the radical demands that God makes of our relationships with Him. Here's an example. Maybe you saw this this past week. I felt the truth of cross-bearing lives, the tension of the pilgrimage of our spiritual journeys lived out in our world. As I listened to George Hill, the Milwaukee Bucks basketball player. Now, if you can remember back to the beginning of this past week, which probably seems like so long ago, but things uh, took some strange turns, starting with the uh, violence in Kenosha. And I just happened to catch this interview with George Hill. It wasn't, uh, I don't follow George Hill. In fact, I don't even know anything else about George Hill except that he's a Milwaukee Bucks player. But he was sitting in this interview and they were trying to get the live stream going and you could kind of tell that he was, he was focused and he wasn't excited about the fact that they had just won the game. 
Uh, and so the first person asks him a question about, um, about the rhythm of the game and whether the bucks were getting into the rhythm of the game. And then the second person asks the question about three-point shots. And, and George Hills starts to say, I don't think the world has gotten into the rhythm yet or the same rhythm yet. And then he goes on to say, I, I just don't think we should be playing games like nothing else is going on in the world. And it was very interesting to see this happening before our eyes, to see his personal spiritual pilgrimage being lived out with some kind of radical demand upon his mind and heart in the context of this past week. By the end of the interview, he couldn't do anything else but be present in the world of that suffering rather than in the bubble of basketball. The next day he wasn't on the roster to play and then if you followed this you know what happened that pretty soon none of the Bucks even came on the court to play. They decided they didn't want to be isolated from the world nor insulated from the radical demands that their relationships as loving and caring human beings and the, the demand that God made upon their lives. It was a cross-bearing moment that played itself out in front of us. They didn't know if the other team was, um, they, um, they just decided they would forfeit and the other team didn't accept the forfeit. Instead, the other team joined them in the suffering and then we know that baseball was postponed and we know that football practices was postponed and we watched how the whole world of spo sports took a pause for reflection and for discerning what leading and what following meant. Different priorities were played out. What does following Jesus and dying to our false selves while being formed in Christ and then bearing our cross mean to us in our daily lives? Have we gotten out of line anywhere? Have we sought isolation or insulation? Has God challenged us to let go of anything and die to it in order that we might be more formed in Christ-likeness and that became a cross that we bore? This is the kind of journey we are invited to. This is a following journey, a formation journey, a cross-bearing journey, and ultimately a journey, a journey of resurrection, hope, and the kingdom of God coming to earth. Jesus is the best person to follow and the best presence to lead us. The world needs us as we walk this out in step. One of my favorite quotes comes from Elizabeth Barrett Browning and it was reminded to me as uh, George Hill talked about the rhythm of the world. Barrett Browning writes, caught up in love and taught the whole of life in a new rhythm. That's the cross-bearing life, the life of love, caught up in love and taught the whole of life in a new rhythm. This is the rhythm that our world needs from us right now. Let us follow. Let us be formed. Let us bear our crosses. And let us love our world. Amen.
Okay, I'll try the benediction with sound on this time. I apologize for that. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. May God lift his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen.